sexual sex. In our daily living, we feel separation because we fail to cooperate. So in 1 Corinthians 3, 21, 22, 23, we read, So you must not boast about men, for all belong to you, Paul, Paulus, Cephas, the world, life, death, present and the future, all belong to you. You belong to Christ and Christ to God. Here is a great truth showing that there is no separation anywhere, but all belong to you. Paul, Apollos, Cephas, the world, life, death, the present, the future, all belong to you. You belong to Christ and Christ. God shows distinctly that there is no separation anywhere between man and man, and there's no separation in the world. It's all in man's mind. Because it is in man's mind, it's the cause of all our troubles. Separation. Our separate nations, our separate economic frontiers, our separate societies, our separate social distinctions and separation everywhere is created in man's mind. Politics causes separation in nations. So you see we have separation everywhere. And we wonder how we are going to get rid of this separation so that we can get freedom. Freedom only comes when separation is eliminated. The time will come, of course, when man will see the folly of his ways. If he doesn't, we go on from one war to another, and each war becomes more and more exterminating than the other. So consequently, if we do not cease to understand the true nature of things, what will happen is this, that the people of the world will fight each other through separation. And then, when there's only a few left, they will say, let us cooperate. And I think that it's time that we should think about those things. Science is helping us to live more freely and united if we would only turn our eyes in the right direction. Science has explained many things that have hitherto been unknown. Science has shown the universality of matter. Science has shown us the great power that is within the atom. Science has shown us that this energy is within ourselves. And science has shown us that this energy can be controlled and directed by the mind of man. But we have turned our eyes in the wrong direction. Instead of having right thinking, our thinking is wrong. Right thinking only comes when we discern the self and then realize what is behind the self. So that we can think correctly. And we can never think correctly unless we have discerned the causes of our troubles. Even if we're caught up in our own thoughts, our images, ideas, we're caught up in our own discerning, then we have lost that which is real in itself. Immediately we create a thought. If we are constantly aware, we know what that thought is and we know what it would bring because every thought manifests somewhere, it manifests something. And to be constantly aware is the secret of great development. Consciously aware is the secret of all Master's power. And I think that you will know what I am saying. When we think of the Master himself, and the tremendous power he obtained, through this desire. 
In our ordinary daily living, we feel a sense of separation because we fail to cooperate with each other. War has proved this more than anything else. The world is quarreling over how it shall live. But this is not a new quarrel, it is as old as communal life. For through the centuries, history reveals man's age-long struggle for freedom, the right to live. Perhaps it's because man has caught a glimpse of enduring freedom that makes the struggle so fierce today. The effects we are noticing today is but the causes of yesterday. And no matter how we treat these effects, it will not relieve us of our troubles. In fact, we are contributing to them by our selfish cravings and desires. Our energy is directed towards things and what is all the conflict in this world about? Things. Mind of man is turned into the relative world, and he lives in the relative world, and that's the cause of his destruction. It is our inward poverty that makes us crave for things, and this inward poverty is created because we have not yet realized that which is eternal. We have to recognize eternal values. Then we will know the difference between eternal values and relative values. And then we will see then that the eternal values is the only thing that worth keeping and holding. We will see then that the eternal values, which are the real things in life, we will no longer of this inward poverty because we struggle for the outer. Is there a remedy? I say yes, and the Master points the way. Our ideas are in conflict. For instance, we are afraid of communism, so we legislate to outlaw it, and all those who have the same ideas. Ideas separate us, like communism and democracy. But when we look into the matter, we see that it is all in man's mind. It is only by the free, systematic, unselfish, cooperating, tackling of the causes of separation that the cause of war or strife can be eradicated. So you see what I mean, don't you? But all this is in the mind of man. And man is dealing with ideas. He's still reveling in the reality. But you, as disciples of this great, wonderful truth, must know the inner values, the eternal values, and must look to that where there is unity, that unity which is in us and is the eternal value in the whole universe. It is only when we love and assist each other instead of fearing and hating can we hope to banish our self-imposed misery and suffering. One group is separated from another in nations, in religion, in politics, in commerce, in families, in societies, etc. So, in our daily living, we are separated from one another, all in competition with each other. No wonder that the world cannot realize what separation means because everyone is caught up in it. We can never free ourselves until we discern what separation is and what we are doing. How extraordinary is this great when we see then that it is within ourselves as the cause of all separation, and when we see that separation within ourselves is the cause of all other miseries, we will begin to realize the importance of discerning and seeing how we are separated from one another, how we feel the separation. We must discern it. We must feel it and see it. Then we can dissolve it. 
In my last lecture we saw that there can be one master mind working everywhere. What I'm going to show you is there is but one earth, yet man divides the earth into various countries. Countries are divided up into boundaries called states. Each city has its own separate council, etc. The land is divided up into various farms and we put a fence around and we say this is my land. But you will notice that the earth is still one earth. But the land on the other side of the fence is the same. Therefore, in reality, there is no separation, even on the earth, except in man's mind. God is one. He put us on the earth as one family. To live in peace as one family should be. Looking to the Father, who created us in his likeness. In our experiences is then we unfold. So I want you to see this now. The time has come for each and every one of you who are disciples of this great mighty truth to discern of what you are doing. You have passed through your experiences. Your experiences of the past are in the present. Now, they are with you at this very moment. If you can gain then your unfoldment through those experiences in the present and discern what you are doing now, you will free yourself from craving, from inward poverty, You'll free yourself from all these things that create separation <clears throat> and destruction, war and so forth. How can I explain it easier to you? See this clearly in yourself because you are the world and the world's unity begins. We have a portion of the universal mind fenced off for our own purpose, apparently separate but not separate from the whole, for the infinite mind includes all forms. It itself is without form, but form is created in it. Therefore the form is not separated from it and must be of its own substance. We see then how clear this is, that even in the mind of God in which we exist, there can be no separation. Science has proved to us that matter itself, as a basis of energy that exists throughout the whole universe, in which there is no separation. And every piece of matter is like a pearl on a chain all united in that one substance out of which to rule. Just like the iceberg that rises out of the silent liquid of the sea and becomes a crystallized form. Yet it may have many crystallized <coughs> chemicals above the water line which seem separate and distinct from all other things but it rose out of the one silent, the sea. And into the such silent sea again, if we were mere, and dissolve and become one out of which it arose. We are the same. We apparently feel that we are separate. But when you begin to discern the causes of your ideas of separation. When it's revealed to you all these things, then you will begin to free yourself from them. And then this life that is unity, that is wisdom, that is power, that is love, will manifest through you. That is the world that we are looking forward to. 
You were the beginning of that war. Unless we get a thorough understanding of this great underlying principle, we will always live in separation, which is the cause of all strife, whether it be between ideas, nations, or human beings. And we are mostly concerned with human beings because we are human beings. And human beings are the most important thing on earth to us and to God. All forms are thoughts of the Creator. And His consciousness or will animating, holding, and sustaining them. We are therefore sons and daughters of the infinite God. Remember, I say infinite God. We have his consciousness. We know that we know. Therefore, our thinking is created. But do you know that your thinking is created? Have you become aware of the fact that your thinking is created? Or are you just thinking without understanding? But I said of being constantly aware, then you're able to deserve your thoughts. You're not caught up in your thought when you are really discerning your thought. For the simple reason there is something that is discerning that thought. And you're not caught up in the thought, but you know that by the very thought you think you have created something. According to the thought, so shall it be. According to the tree, so shall the fruit be. We create images in our minds by our consciousness. These are secondary and have only the power we give them. Yet the Creator creates images in His infinite mind, having His consciousness in them. These are primary, real made in his substance, existing in his infinite mind. You already know what infinity means. It is bigger than the mind of man. Man's mind cannot comprehend it. Only know that God is our reality, and our reality is God. This which is real in itself, is not discernible, is not analyzable. You can't analyze it and say it is this, is that. If I say the infinite is infinite, I only make a relative term in regarding to the infinite. But when I begin to discern my own thoughts, discern my own self, and then I reach a stage where I find something that is not discernible, except that I know that it is, and I know that it is this that is discerning, then I am free from my thoughts. I am no longer bound up in them. I am no longer in separation because I have realized unity. I have found that which is behind the self. Although I shall never know what it is, just as we do not know what electricity is, that which is behind the light. But we know there is a light there. And we know that electricity is the cause of the light. And we know also, when you have seen me, you know the cause behind this body that is light. You do not know what life is, but you see the manifestation of it. I am the thinker. It is this life that we must realize and discern our thinking so that we can dissolve separation, destroy this separation, destroy this great weapon that man is using against man. We are caught up in our political gym. We're caught up because we listen to fools expressing a lot of nonsense. We think we are going to get something and we get nothing. We hear talk about nations and UNO. 
We hear about the war taking place in Korea. We look at our papers every morning and see how things are going on. And all the time in our minds, we are condoling this mass murder that's going on continuously. We agree to it. We hope it takes place. We hope the enemy can be destroyed, burnt up. And what happens to ourselves in the meantime? Because we destroy our brother, we destroy ourselves. And we condole, Master Murder. Look into your minds and see if you do not. You hope every morning for a success of the Western Allies. And when there is no success, then you are depressed. You wonder if there's going to be a, a total war. You wonder if you're going to be caught up in it. You're caught up in it already. You're bound up in it now. I am going to tell you in my own words a story about the Master that will help you to understand what I mean. We've all read and heard of the Jewish feast. And as Jesus was a Jew, he and his disciples went up to Jerusalem. They stayed in an inn at the foot of the Mount of Olives on the north side. On the morning of the feast, Jesus and his disciples wandered down to Jerusalem. It was on the Sabbath day. They passed the healing pool of Bethesda, B-E-T-H-E-S-D-A, it is uh, properly spelled, which was thronged with people. Remember that Bethesda and Bethesda are two different words all together. The people believed in the healing virtues of the pool. And as Jesus and his disciples stood near the pool, he saw a man lying helpless without anyone to help him to the pool. Jesus said, My brother man, would you be healed? And the man replied, I am helpless. I cannot reach the pool. Jesus replied, But my brother, God is everywhere. Not only in that pool. And if you will believe this, you shall be healed where you lie. The font of health is within your soul. It has all lost parts, and the key is faith. And you can have this key to open the door and there plunge into the healing font and be made whole. The man looked at the master with anxious eyes, saying, Please give me this key. Then Jesus said, Do you believe what I have said to you? Then according to your faith, so shall it be done. Now arise, take up your bed and walk. And the man at once arose and walked away, praising God. The great point that I want to show you here the meaning of the Master's word, that God is everywhere, there is nowhere where he is not. He is omnipresent. Not only in the pool external to yourselves, or whatever you think it may be that will give you the help, but that part of health is within your own soul. The miracle takes place within you, not without you. A miracle always takes place within and never from without, showing distinctly that the same God existing in you and me and in that healing font, which is the Spirit, there dwells the key to our faith and our understanding. And the man at once arose, walked away, God. Now can you see great mighty truth? The man of Galilee had it in the palm of his head. In his mind it was clear. His sayings are so clear to us now. In the knowledge that we have acquired through these lessons. 
we can understand. <coughs> now when the priests heard of the healing, they were enraged because by their man-made laws, a man may not heal on the Sabbath. But Jesus said, My father works on the Sabbath, so may I. He sends his rain, his sunshine. He makes the grass grow, the flowers bloom, and speak the harvest just the same on the Sabbath as on other days. If it is lawful for the grass to grow and the flowers to bloom, surely it is not wrong to heal the stricken man. Some people go to church on Sunday. On Sunday, we stop all particular work. You cannot work or clean the floor or your dishes. You make your food on the Saturday. And in fact, why should you eat it on the Sunday anyhow, if it's so terrible that you can't do anything on a Sunday? But you go to church on Sunday. You dress yourself up on your best Sunday clothes. And you sit down and you listen to something. And then the Sunday is the good day. You don't say anything bad to anybody on the Sunday. You don't quarrel with one another. And it is nice to keep that quiet, peaceful time on a Sunday. But lo and behold, Monday morning comes <laughs> and the brooms begin to fly and the people begin to fly and hair and skin flies here and there and there you are at it again. All days are the same. The grass grows every day. The sun shines every day. The flowers bloom every day. God is working every day. And that's your day. Every day. The disciple of this truth is an everyday worker in the truth. Not only one day in a week, or for a few minutes on your knees. One fellow came to me yesterday and he said, you know, when I get down on my knees to pray, he says, it hurts my knee. You know? I said, why don't you stand up and pray? <laughs> That's as good. Well, he couldn't see the joke at all. He thought he must get down on his knees and put his head between his knees and hide his face, and that way he could pray. But if you saw the picture of the three initiations, you'll see one person kneeling down with his head bowed. You'll see the next person standing with his head bowed. And the next person you will see Head up, looking up, and his arms outstretched at his screen. That is the true initiation. So, if you have got sore knees from praying, I say stand up and you will pray just as good. And if your prayer is from your heart, if you're thinking deep enough, you'll find that your thoughts will manage. As long as you know what you're doing. If you're thinking you're praying to a God that is away in the distance, somewhere far away, well, you're living in an illusion because God is everywhere and that thought of life is within you. We have to reach out further than man's limited conception before we can see the grandeur of the whole in which we live and have our being. And it is here that science has come to our aid in our daily living. When we can grasp the great significance of what I am going to say, you will understand what occupational therapy really means. Science says that ether of space is the basis of matter. It interpenetrates and is the framework in which all forms are built. And this ether fills all space and is invisible to the physical eye. 
It is a substance more real than matter. In fact, without it, no matter could exist. So without the ether of space, you couldn't exist at all in the flesh. Science has proved this, and when religion keeps step with science, we'll lose a lot of this stupidity, this nonsense that we hear, this rock that we hear Sunday after Sunday. We will begin to move along with the scientific investigation and find all about it. As Bishop Barnes said the other day at the Congress in England, there is high time that religion was made up to date and kept in step with our scientific investigations. And that is true. Far behind the time. Just go back a little while ago, think of the Spanish Inquisition. People were burnt at the stake, burnt to death, mind you, because they held a separate belief. And those who burnt them were supposed to be Christians, following the footsteps of Jesus Christ. I ask you this question, were they Christians? According to the teachings of Christ, I say they were no more Christians but barbarians. But the church supported these things, and it was the church that did it. It is not more than 200 years ago since Galilee says the earth was round, while the church maintained that the earth was flat, and made poor Galilee recant his statement. But we know now that the earth is round. But that belief was so in the mind of those people that they would destroy any individual that would say it was wrong. If that is the case, then it is high time that religion and science moved along together. Then we would know that the teachings of Christ was correct because he was scientific. His teachings are the greatest science in the world. There is no scientific knowledge greater than he. And I'll prove it to you. I am told through spiritual means that this substance is a product of the universal mind and is immediately affected by our thoughts and mouths according to the image we hold. And as it is the basis of matter of which our bodies are made, we we'll readily see how our thoughts and emotions are all pictured in our organism in the various troubles we suffer from. When there's anything wrong with you, you're caught up. You can no longer separate yourself from your trouble. You can't look at it as something external to yourself. If you could, you wouldn't suffer from it. But as you're caught up in it, then it binds you. And your thoughts then of that binding as our picture, your emotions and thoughts are our picture in your organism and makes the condition worse. How are you ever going to learn to eliminate these conditions? How are you ever going to learn how to separate yourself from these conditions? By first of all discerning your thoughts, by seeing them as you would see them upon a screen separate and distinct. Without emotion, without fear, without comparison, without any idea of right and wrong, to see them completely with no fear of any kind, then you will be free from them. Now look into your own minds and see what you do when you feel a pain, when anything happens to you, think what you do. Immediately you are caught up in your thinking. You are bound. If you can see that you are bound, then you can free yourself. But if you don't know you are bound, then you cannot free yourself. So I say to you, recognize quickly that you are bound. As Jesus said, recognize 
unit vastly at once, quickly, then you will be free. There is a greater world more real than the one we know of at present that surrounds and interpenetrates ours, into which we will one day enter. It has been found beyond doubt that man does not die with his body, but lives eternally in the infinite mind, ever expanding his consciousness in the consciousness of the infinite God. Because it must be so. Our consciousness must expand in the consciousness of God, because it's the consciousness of God that is expressing itself through the consciousness of man. Therefore, the consciousness of man must expand in the consciousness of the infinite God. Therefore, our little worries and perplexities feed into nothingness as we realize the great and which we live. These perplexities in which we are caught up in every day, our little anxiety, our little fear, our little emotions. Think how many emotions you have in a day. The whole body is in a state of rumble with all little emotions here and there. One great sweep of emotion very often cleanses the whole system out of all these vortices of energy that are negative, that are working against you the greatest emotion to eliminate them all is to love that is beyond human comprehension. So the mind of man cannot comprehend the thing called love. Although this is only at present realized by a few, it will become a common fact, the fact that the earth is round and not flat. Science is probing the ether of space. And one day we will enter into a new world where we will find all those who have gone before us, enjoying the freedom that we should have here and now by true understanding. So I say without fear of contradiction that there is scientific investigation that is now probing the ether. Troubling ether for sound, listening, inventing new instruments, finer and finer. One day science will strike upon that note where we shall hear and see that which is taking place in the ether beyond the sight of man. Then the mind of man will expand. A new world will open before him. Let us hope that it will come soon before catastrophe overwhelms us. The whole universe is an expression of the great absolute being. The pattern expressed in the mind of the Absolute, which is in the form of his will, is being manifested daily. Thy will not mine, O Lord. The laws are but the expression of his will, and it was this that the Master saw clearly. The universe and man, which is included therein, is ruled by the law of God. It is when we run contrary to the law we suffer. We become the law when we act with the law. How often have I told you that the greatest law is love. Love the Lord thy God with all thy strength, with all thy mind, with all thy heart, and love thy neighbor as thyself. How simple the whole thing is, but how few can see it. And the Master said, Yes, love the Lord thy God with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and all thy heart, and love your neighbor as yourself. There is no 
greater law than these. These fulfill all. Even on the Sabbath day, people are criticizing each other of what the other has on, etc. If we went to church in a bathing suit, think what would be said about it. It's not what one wears, but what is in one's heart that counts. For it is this that helps you in your daily contact. This is occupational therapy. Yes, it is a living therapy. So it is not what you wear. So if you went to church in a bathing suit, I knew what was in your heart to write. No matter what anybody else said, it wouldn't matter anything to you. But we see how we are bound by tradition, formality. We are caught up in conformity. Before we know where we are, we are no longer free. We are bound by conformity, by tradition, by beliefs. We are always prone to criticize the other fellow, failing to see our own shortcomings. Jesus says, you hypocrite, take the plank out of your own eye, then you will see better how to take the splinter out of your brother's eye. Most people are thinking about themselves. Yes, before breakfast and after breakfast too. They would be a hundred times more concerned about a headache of theirs than they would be about my death or yours. Even if you are lied about ridiculed, double-crossed, and sold out by every three of your intimate friends. Don't indulge in self-pity, for human nature has still traces of the jungle in it. Instead of moaning about why it should happen to you, just think what happened to Jesus. One of his most trusted friends denied him three times. Another sold him for a purse of silver. Nearly all his friends left him when he got into trouble. Why should you and I expect more? And we know what human nature is. But there is one who will never forsake you. And that is the greatest of all. That is a must. God. God never forsakes even his most disobedient child. Here lies your strength and not in human nature. Not what other people will do to you or think about you. Even if you are double-crossed by your best friends, what does it matter? Are you going to mourn about it? Are you going to be caught up in it? Are you going to rave and go to bed sick about it? To think that such and such a person, my best friend, would do that to me. How often have I heard this story? My best friend. Do you know my best friend, my most trusted friend? Double cross. I think you're putting too much trust in human nature. Probably you have double-crossed somebody else before now. <laughs> so you're just getting back paid. <laughs> I discovered long ago I could not keep people from criticizing me unjustly. What I could and did do was not to let it disturb me. If you are afraid to do anything for fear of being criticized, remember that if you know in your heart you are right, don't let it bother you what people say about you. The greatest men in the world have been slandered and criticized. But did they give up? No. 
Their cause was greater than all the criticisms against them. Those who criticize generally have to eat humble pie in the end. Most criticism does not amount to much anyhow, for it is generally the weak-minded that criticize, the envious, the jealous, kind of people who are weak-minded and narrow. You can't please everyone. If you try to please one, you offend another. If you patch it up with one, you fall foul of another. So, before you know where you are, you've stirred up a hornet's nest. What are you going to do? My motto is, do the very best you can in your daily tasks. Carry goodwill towards all and leave the criticizing to the fools who do not know much better. That is good advice. You couldn't get better. And by doing so, you will be able to discern what you're doing. You will see clearly that you're not caught up in these things. You'll be free. Most of your troubles today is brought about by resentment, by conditions in which you react to. You're sick because a person does this and does that. I have people sick every day because why? Because of the fact that they have resented this, resented that. Somebody has done something to them and the whole of their heart begins to flutter. Then a habit pattern is created, the whole story comes up. Then the crying and the tears fall and all the rest of it. And I say that's good, go on, cry, cry. You've been keeping this cry business back all the time. Now let it out and you'll be much better. So the crying business comes over and they feel better. Then I talk sense to them. And when I talk sense, they get better. And that's exactly what I'm trying to do now, to do talk sense. Just as you step into the sunshine, so you can step into the rays of divine love and receive its benefits. And if you feel the need of the protecting love of the Father, all you need to do is to open yourself up to it. You must love God as you would love your own child. In this way, the protecting love of God flows around you. You can love God as a friend as a brother, as a companion, the burning love you feel towards one you love most. Turn this love also towards the Father, and your love will grow stronger and stronger. Because that love, it grows in you. So strong will it grow, that nothing can break it, because you love. Father most. And how do you love the Father? You know all the great things, the life in which you live. You open yourself and you feel the joy and the happiness, and you give forth this joy and thanksgiving the fact that God has created you in his image and life. I know that this life in me is real. I know that I could not be conscious except by it. Even if not, I talk relatively to you about it. I make it relative to you in the meantime. But if you can think as I think and feel as I feel, then it will become a real. But I can only talk to you in relative terms and regard to you. Just as the Master talked in parables, so do I talk in relative words. Feel this wonderful thing that rises within yourself. Give love, do not seek it. 
and you will be in touch with the infinite power that controls all things. For all is well with those who love all. A fool shows instantly that he is angry. A prudent man ignores an insult. Proverbs 12, 16. Benediction. Oh, divine love, fill my heart full of thy love so that I may overcome all criticism. Teach me to cling to thee even so others err against thee. Even if suffering come nigh me, thy love will keep me close to thy bosom, while I feel the warmth of thy healing love pouring through me. I pray that I will never forget thy love for me, so that my soul will always rejoice. No matter what others do to me, Help me to be like thy son, Jesus, that my love may be as strong to say, forgive them, for they know not 